OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. My name is Todd Enlow, and I am the Chief of Staff of the Cherokee Nation, and I will be your MC for today's event. Thank you so much for attending this episode of Chalagi, wherever we are. Today, we take on a difficult subject, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Difficult, difficult because of the loved ones we've lost, because of the isolation is forced upon us, and the conversations we've had due to varying opinions. In the next 45 minutes, you'll hear from Cherokee Nation administration, including Cherokee Nation businesses, from Cherokee elders and speakers, from Cherokee Nation public health, and your at-large tribal counselors. And learn a little history about a trailblazing Cherokee Nation healthcare professional for those of you who would like to share your thoughts and comments and questions about this event on social media, please feel free to do so using the hashtag Cherokee wherever we are. Also, please stay tuned through the entire show today as we'll be announcing the winners of two laptops. You could be a winner. Very early on when the pandemic or when the Cherokee Nation learned this pandemic's gravity, the speed and breadth at which it was proliferating, Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. assembled a team which I was honored to be a part of. That team is still functioning today. It's tasked with gathering required global knowledge in terms of health, operational awareness, and potential logis logistical issues, and the requirements in order to make fact-based decisions that were sound. Cherokee Nation Health Department, headed by Dr. Stephen Jones, to this very day maintains constant communications with health leaders within the United States government, the Centers for Disease Control, as well as other state and local health care systems, and the IHS or Indian Health Service directors to have the latest data and recommendations. The health team strives to keep us safe and informed. In lieu of federal and state government inaction, Cherokee Nation made the critical decisions to be proactive. We know, we know and we knew we simply had to protect our elders and speakers, ensuring our language and culture would be preserved and perpetuated. We knew placing people in isolation would be difficult because Cherokees historically love to gather as community and family and friends to support one another. We wanted to ensure isolated citizens had access to food, and you'll hear how we accomplished that as well as many other steps we took to ensure the collective future of our nation. As with many tribes, we were inherently concerned about saving our people, our language, and our culture, and in turn, saving our language. We wanted to protect our citizens, our communities, our workforce, and their families. And I am proud to say that we did. But before we get into that, I bring you to a driving force behind the community organization and compassion led throughout this pandemic. And that's our Deputy Principal Chief, who will provide the opening remarks followed by our blessing. Deputy Chief. CEO, thank you once again for tuning in and streaming this informative program. Our goal is to keep all Cherokees informed, aware, and educated on the efforts our government and our businesses are doing on behalf of the people. Transparency and open communication are a hallmark as our leaders of this powerful tribal nation. COVID-19 travel restrictions greatly hampered our ability to stay as connected as we would like. Nothing beats traveling to your geographic location, shaking hands, sharing food, and discussing the business and culture of the Cherokee Nation. However, no matter where you are, you are a vital part of our government and will always be important to the future of our success. In addition, uh, in this edition of Cherokee, wherever we are, you will get an opportunity to better understand how we navigated the most dangerous public health crisis in our lifetime, how this administration made strategic decisions in health care, education, housing, and economic development, and how those efforts would best protect and preserve our families, our culture, and our communities. The Cherokee Nation has been nationally recognized for the efforts to prioritize our first language speakers, elders, youth, and our most vulnerable citizens. How effectively we manage COVID testing, educated our citizenry on scientific protocols, and distributed life-saving vaccines. But these are values of the Cherokee people at work in a pressing and stressful chapter of world history. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and a blessing. Please bow with me. 
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and we thank you for the fellowship that you give us. Lord, we ask that you fill our vessels with the fruit of your spirit. Help us give an extra measure of grace and mercy to others as you give to us daily, Lord. We ask that you remind us that the work that we do in this world is, the, is your work, Lord. Help create that path and help give us the strength and the confidence to maintain that path. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Deputy Chief Warner. I appreciate your friendship, your compassion, uh, your compassionate, rational thought during this troubling times and your leadership in the last two years, especially during this pandemic. What don't? The Cherokee Nation went to great lengths in protecting our citizens from health to infrastructure, from mandates to food and supplies, from job saving efforts to job creation. Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin led the charge. And while maintaining the continued growth, intertribal and governmental relationships on a daily basis and throughout the businesses of our nation. Cherokees, wherever you are, this is your Principal Chief, Chuck Hoskin Jr. Chief. What well, Chief of Staff, OCO, I'm so glad that you are joining us for an in-depth discussion about Cherokee Nation, Cherokee Nation businesses, and how our various entities have navigated the COVID-19 pandemic. Without question, it has been a challenging time. Together, we have faced the worst public health crisis in living memory. We've lost family and friends to COVID-19, and sadly, many of those lost were fluent Cherokee speakers. I, like most people, have lost dear friends and close work associates. It's been a heartbreaking experience. However, Deputy Chief Brian Warner and I remain vigilant every day, guiding the great Cherokee Nation in this new age based on science, facts, and compassion. Cherokee Nation was able to survive this pandemic because the Cherokee leaders that came before us made wise choices in the years leading up to 2020. Because of those smart decisions, we are blessed with a robust healthcare system. Throughout the pandemic, we listened to experts and acted quickly to implement safety measures like the mask mandate and working from home guidelines. And we never lost hope. We never stopped prioritizing the Cherokee people. That has been the key to the tribe's success in combating the pandemic. When Congress debated how to respond to the pandemic, our government relations team, headed by our delegate to Congress, Kim Teehee, led the fight to bring funding to Indian Country. The funding we received allowed Cherokee Nation to organize some of the most responsive and progressive healthcare efforts in the world. With that funding, we also launched new service programs to help our families isolated at home, including around $60 million in COVID impact payments directly to citizens here on the reservation and across the country. We expanded efforts in broadband and offered citizens better Wi-Fi to stay connected. We invested in technology upgrades so Cherokee students could stay on schedule in their educational journey. We developed new programs within our One Fire office to help survivors of domestic violence. And we built the largest emergency food distribution infrastructure in the history of the Cherokee Nation. We've served almost 12 million meals and about 190,000 people. I think one of the most critical things we learned is that we all need to know this. You don't have to be in this alone. That sense of mental well-being is at the root of something deeply important to me and First Lady January Hoskin. By the way, it's my wife's birthday, so happy birthday to the First Lady of the Cherokee Nation. We made record investment in behavioral health through the Cherokee Nation Public Health and Wellness Fund. It puts essential dollars into physical wellness and drug treatment centers. It will play a major role in helping us return to that sense of normalcy that we all want and ultimately create healthier Cherokee families. The positive impact will be felt in the short term and for generations to come. Our frontline healthcare heroes at the Cherokee Nation deserve our most heartfelt widow. 
our health care workers have been challenged like no other time in recent history. They work long hours to save lives and ensure Cherokees remained as healthy as possible. Our team administered 123,000 COVID tests and has distributed almost 60,000 vaccinations. I can't imagine where the Cherokee Nation would be today without these healthcare professionals. I'm excited that later in this episode, you'll hear, you'll hear directly from one of those healthcare heroes that we have at Cherokee Nation, which by the way, is the largest tribal healthcare system in America. We have a large number of Cherokees who absolutely count on our tribal government as an essential helping hand here on the reservation and across the country. Last but not least, a key to our successful response to COVID-19 has been the Cherokee people. Throughout history, when the odds seemed insurmountable, the Cherokee people joined together to beat the odds. Just as we have done throughout history, we put our communities ahead of ourselves, and we protected one another. Yes, the pandemic has changed the way we do some operations, but our core values will always be the same. We will continue to serve our people's needs and ensure our citizens, including our most vulnerable, veterans, elders, young children, have the opportunities, programs, and services that they deserve. What do? Thank you, Chief Hoskin. And looking back to just about a year ago, you were working closely with a group of people to make sure that not only our Cherokee Nation, but our business employees were protected from all the uncertainties that were swirling in the wake of this pandemic. Here is a part of a video sent to all Cherokee Nation businesses employees in April of 2020 describing what was going on then. I've been working closely with our government relations team to ensure that our tribal government and our businesses were being considered in the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, which passed Congress last week. I'm happy to say our persistent efforts were effective. The bill provides more than $2 billion in funding for the Indian Health Service, small businesses, nutrition, housing, and other programs that will support our tribal health systems and frontline health care workers. The bill also provides potential economic assistance for businesses, which may partially offset some of the revenue losses that we are incurring. We continue to work with members of Congress and with federal agencies to ensure that this federal funding maximizes the benefit to our government and businesses so that we can maintain services and support our employees. In the coming days, there are many more difficult decisions to be made. The work group continues to press forward with careful consideration at every turn. Our goal is to position CNB for future success. Stay healthy, stay safe. What hope? Joining Chief Hoskin and myself to talk more about our response and our businesses and how we weathered the brunt of the COVID-19 storm is Cherokee Nation Business's CEO, Chuck Garrett. Thanks to both of you for being here. So what I'd like to do is just have a little free-form conversation with you gentlemen uh, talking about our response, both from the businesses and the government. And so, Chuck, I'm going to start with you. If you could, you know, it's been a difficult and long, arduous year. Uh, could you talk about some of the initial responses and what Cherokee Nation businesses did to protect not only our patrons, but also our employees? Certainly, and it's very good to be with the, you, Chief of Staff, and of course you, Chief. Um, well, it was, of course, uh, a shock and, and required some immediate and, and focused responses. We saw the pandemic moving across Europe, so we were trying to prepare ourselves for what at that point seemed uh, like a, a likely uh, impact to us. And of course, the chief and I had many conversations uh, on a daily basis to prepare for um, what might uh, occur. And the chief made it very clear from the beginning that it was uh, my priority and his priority to um, protect the employees and our patrons from uh, the virus. So we began to make plans to uh, shut down uh, our facilities to make certain that our employees could be safe and our patrons weren't exposed. And that's what we did. You know, we, we began to systematically shut down operations. 
uh, prepare for uh, what we thought would be a short uh, shutdown, which turned out to be a, a much longer, as you know, uh, but uh, preparing our, uh, our finances and our people for uh, an unknown period of time. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Chief, um, from the perspective of the government, obviously Cherokee Nation has about 391,000 citizens around the world. It's a big task to try and keep track of all of those citizens and protect them. Can you talk about what the responsibility of good governments and, and a good government should do for its citizens? Well, look, the first job of a government is to uh, protect the people that entrust the elected officials uh, with governing, and that's what we tried to do. That's why we kept our focus on science, facts, and compassion when we made every decision. By the way, I couldn't be more proud of Mr. Garrett and all the men and women at CMB because they had that same focus. I mean, they're a corporation, but they're in it for a long haul. Cherokee Nation's focus is we are in it for a long haul. This is our home forever. So making sure that we respond to people's needs. So you know, early on, we saw a need for food. We got food out to the people particularly out to those isolated elders. Some of those that spoke Cherokee, we took translation documents out to explain to them this new thing, COVID-19, which we were all learning, and certainly for them, getting information in a way that they can appreciate it uh, and makes them feel respected was important. But across our government, we moved into action. So I mentioned food, but we also uh, mobilized our healthcare team. We had the great greatest healthcare system, I think, in Indian country. Uh, and so we were already prepared for perils like COVID-19 because we have such a talented staff and people that study infectious diseases. Uh, what we did is we tapped into that talent and we mobilized them to protect people. So uh, making sure we had uh, a way to lead the country on COVID testing, making sure uh, that our hospitals could be reoriented to take in the surge of patients that came in. Um, we weathered that storm because we were prepared for the unknown. Because look, we're Cherokee. The Cherokee people expect their government, expect the government to be prepared and to respond and to be effective. I think we're the most progressive and dynamic government in the country, and I think it showed during COVID-19. So Chief, uh, just one of the initiatives and uh, a phrase you've used a lot is we're all in this together. Right. And uh, you focus on three initiatives of community, family, and culture. And I just want to say thank you for not realizing when the pandemic started that, that how important that was going to be as far as our success. And right. I just appreciate your, your vision on that. Uh, Mr. Garrett, uh, from the business's perspective, can you talk about some of the critical lessons that you've learned over the last 12 to 14 months? Well. And of course, there have been, been many, uh, some that uh, were really reinforcing things that we, we knew, but uh, clearly a business that has a diversified revenue stream and has diversified businesses is critical. And uh, we knew that, but this was a, an opportunity to see that in under, underscored. And uh, when you have your gaming facilities closed 10 some odd weeks, uh, we were fortunate that we had invested in other businesses and diversified our, uh, our business lines. So that was certainly one. Uh, two, we've always been, always been a very conservative but imprudent um, caretaker of the Cherokee money. And, and when it comes to uh, making certain that we're in a position to weather the storm so that none of our employees or at risk of missing a paycheck, that we can meet our obligations. Uh, we, we, the, that principle and that approach uh, certainly uh, proved to be uh, a sound way to run a business. Um, the other thing is just a reminder how important people are. You know, your your customers, but your employees. And if you are focused on serving them you will be successful. And I think that's one of the great takeaways that we, that we have. Chuck, you talked about something there that I think is pretty important is we didn't have any employees at our businesses that missed a paycheck. Can you talk about what steps we had to take to make sure that happened and in the partnership uh, to make that Make that happen. Yeah. Well, it's certainly a source of great pride for us, and and the chief made it very clear to me that we were going to put and prioritize the employees uh, in terms of their economic security, 
and their careers. And so we um, simply did not consider at any point uh, missing a payroll. Uh, that was just not going to happen. So we uh, invested in that and we uh, were able to uh, provide that sort of uh, certainty in a time that was very uncertain. That was one thing I think our employees could count on. And it was a, a good investment. We're seeing that uh, pay off in terms of their uh, return and, and loyalty to us. And so um, it was the right way to, to run a business. Well, as a chief of staff, I'll tell you that it, I think our employees are the best in the country, and I appreciate the efforts that you went through to, to make sure that they were taken care of. Uh, chief, specifically, we talked a little bit uh, about health care, but can you talk about uh, you know, what we did inside of health care a little bit more and then also you know, what's on the horizon for health care? Sure. Well, you know, I said that we were a health care system that was large but also prepared. But, but look, no health care system in the country or the world was per fully prepared for COVID-19. But it's a credit to the men and women in our health care system that they stepped up to the challenge, working long hours, uh, giving it their all. But the other thing we had to do is during the worst parts of the pandemic, I mentioned the surge of people coming into our health care system, we had to reorient again to make sure that we didn't have what you saw in some parts of the country and some parts of the world, which is people suffering out in hallways or even outside of hospitals. We didn't have that at the Cherokee Nation. Across the country, you saw uh, shortages of ventilators. We came close, but we had uh, put ourselves in a position of strength. And here's the other thing that amazed me. You were involved in this, Chief of Staff. We had staff that was looking around the world for innovative solutions. Uh, and we were prepared to do something really innovative with some scuba tanks and some uh, fabricated parts to create BiPAP machines. What that told me is that we have staff that is not just going to throw its hands up when it's the worst crisis ever in our healthcare system. They're going to roll up their sleeves. They're going to find solutions. Now, as the pandemic wore on, testing was so important and contact tracing. So we set up drive-through testings, I think, before much of the country did. And we did it successfully. Our contact tracers uh, moved with lightning speed, and that's how we kept protecting each other from this spread. Uh, when it came to vaccines, there was another opportunity for the nation to shine, and we did. And we had the most efficient and effective uh, vaccination distribution, I think, in the country. How did we do it? First of all, the talented staff that we have. Second of all, we used the investments we made to build a drive through facility in Stillwell. Uh, we also made sure we could reorient our clinics and our staff, even taking staff that didn't ordinarily give shots, training them to go do that. Uh, it was really special to see our OSU med students out there doing it. It was we're all in it together, whether it's citizens or our healthcare team, and that spirit helped us through. What we've learned, though, in the pandemic is that even though we're the largest healthcare system in the country, we have more work to do. One of the things that the Deputy Chief and I are concerned about and focused on is what is the long-term effects of COVID on people's mental well-being, also their physical well-being. And so we uh, proposed and the council enacted the Public Health and Wellness Act. We are going to revolutionize what we do in the Cherokee Nation for mental health, drug treatment, and also physical wellness. I mean, Cherokees have always been concerned about a holistic approach to living life and living it well. The Cherokee people believe in that. They deserve a government that will provide that. And so going forward, that's what we're going to focus on. Thank you, Chief. Chuck, how was CMB really able to weather the storm? I mean, when you shut down, revenues drop, um, and obviously Cherokee Nation um, has a lot of funding that's dependent upon the success of Cherokee Nation businesses. And how, how are you able to weather this, and how are we doing now? Yeah, well... You know, it was, it was interesting because it's, you know, the purpose, our purpose is to, to generate uh, revenue streams for the, the nation and to create career opportunities for citizens. And, and so we were very committed to maintaining our uh, dividend obligation to the, to the nation throughout the, the pandemic. Uh, again, coming back to a diversified business, uh, w one of our business lines in terms of uh, federal contracting uh, thrived during that time. 
Uh, we continue to work extremely hard on uh, growing that business as well as some of our other business interests to compensate for the, the gaming revenue that we lost. So uh, it was a credit to our employees. It was a credit to uh, our team that, that managed uh, our way through that. So what the folks may be seeing at home are some images of uh, some of the conversations with Cherokee Nation businesses and, and staff in, in the variety of the services that we have uh, throughout the 14 counties and ultimately uh, the United States. And so, Chuck, thank you for your efforts uh, in this trying time to, to make sure that we keep a vision moving forward and I appreciate, appreciate your leadership there. Thank you. Chief, last question is going to go to you. Um, it really deals with the funding that we received. Obviously, a lot of thought went into strategically trying to spend the dollars for our first round of funding. Um, can you talk about that and the strategy and some of the thoughts that went behind that? And then also, um, you know, what are we doing to secure the second round of funding uh, that is soon to be available uh, around the United States from the federal government? Well, a great deal of thought did go into it. Uh, we had to do it quickly because, first of all, the Cherokee people were counting on us. Second of all, the criteria surrounding those CARES Act funding really dictated we had to act quickly. But I am very proud of what we did. So here's what we focused on. First of all, we focused on direct relief to Cherokee citizens. I'm talking about direct payments at a time when people were affected by the COVID economy and they were affected personally in some way by COVID, maybe not directly with their health care, but a loved one that they had to care for. So we prioritized students and elders and we moved on to the larger population. Ultimately, it was around 60 million in direct payments to Cherokee citizens. And, and I know this made a difference in their lives during a difficult time. We also focused on other things, you know, students, uh, had a challenging time. I just went to Sequoia High School's graduation uh, yesterday evening. I was reminded what a difficult year it was for all students adjusting to this new landscape in which you're vir learning virtually more than uh, you typically were before COVID. Uh, in some cases, extracurricular activities cut out. Just a difficult year, the isolation that students felt, but we had to keep them connected. So we made sure to use some, some of that funding to make sure that every kid that we could reach and this is thousands of kids, uh, had some connection to the internet. We live in a day and age where you have to have that, especially if you're a young person learning. Every Cherokee kid deserves the best when it comes to education. They can't access it if they don't have connectivity. Those MiFi devices we sent out, the other efforts that we made to stand up broadband out in some communities that just didn't have it, made a big difference. We looked at our healthcare system. I mentioned this before, but we used some of those dollars to expand the capacity of that healthcare system at a time when the Cherokee people uh, needed it. All the things I talked about with COVID testing and rollouts of the vaccines and uh, buildings we put up for the drive-through testing and, and, and one-site drive-through vaccinations, that required those federal dollars. A lot of our food effort, the largest uh, emergency food effort in the history of the Cherokee Nation was fueled by those dollars uh, under the CARES Act. I think we put those to good use when we made sure people could stay at home when they needed to stay at home or close to home and they could drive through and get food to keep their families sustained. You know, we also looked at the future and we said, look, people are going to have to adjust where they work. And some people were displaced by the COVID economy. So getting to see people get job training of all ages and transition into careers that they could make a good living. That's good during any time for the Cherokee people, but especially during these difficult times of COVID. And we've invested in buildings across the reservation that'll help us continue to respond to COVID, whether it's food, PPE. Speaking of PPE, we have brought domestic mask production back to this country in Stillwell, Oklahoma, a great Cherokee community. That is something that we need in this country. What better place to do it than in the Cherokee Nation on our reservation? Now, we have more work to do. And thankfully, Kim Teehee, our delegate to Congress and our government relations team, kept pushing for more funding for Indian Country. We were successful under this latest plan, the American Rescue Act plan. 
we are now planning for the next phase of COVID response and recovery. Most of it, thankfully, looks like it's going to be recovery because we're moving slowly but steadily into safer territory. So we get to plan for the future. Planning for the future means more of the same. Healthcare, food security, making sure our government offices, our businesses are safe places to work and to visit. I think investing in ways for Cherokee people to be healthier in the future because good health today is a hedge against perils like a virus or other health calamities tomorrow. We know that. We're learning from what happened. We're going to continue to expand connectivity for young people. We have an opportunity here to seize these federal dollars and leverage them, not just for now, but for generations to come. That's what Cherokee people expect out of their government, and that's what we're doing. Great. Thank you. So, Chief, uh, just real quickly, you spoke about the PPE facility uh, there in Stillwell, and uh, it warmed my heart the day that you walked through, did a tour, and were introduced to some of the trainees there on that job site. And I don't know if you were aware of it, but I was hiding in the backgrounds watching you interact <laughs> with those, those trainees. And uh, to watch, in particular, one man's eyes light up as he was explaining the work that he was doing on that machine and what it was, you know, what the final outcome was going to be. It was a young man that had been displaced and lost his job and right. now has an opportunity and to to see that hope and joy pop back into his eyes that was that was a pretty special moment for me you know it's great that we're making Absolutely. masks and, mm -hmm. and I think that's obviously a great benefit but to see how it's transforming in particular that one Cherokee citizen's life really made, meant a lot to me. Absolutely. Hope is the key word there because the people that are going to work at that facility and the one we have in Hulbert uh, are, are getting a sense of hope that maybe they hadn't had for some time because, look, a lot of folks displaced by the economy thinks the world forgot about them. Cherokee Nation never forgot about them. Oh, no, it's interesting because you mentioned Stillwell, and that's, of course, was our first business was in Stillwell in 1969, and, and uh, talking about providing hope to a community and, and uh, a meaningful economic development impact there for, you know, 40 some odd years now, uh, or 50 years, I guess. And so it's been really uh, uh, interesting and fun to, to watch that, and that plant uh, continued to work through uh, the pandemic, there were some times we had to, uh, for safety reasons, shut it, shut it down, but it served um, a lot of different, very meaningful national interests throughout that time. So uh, we have a long history there, Chief, and uh, it's a proud one as well. Well, I want to say thank you. Chief, uh, you know, happy birthday to the First Lady. Right. Uh, I'm also going to take a little bit of liberty and say happy birthday to my daughter, Avery, who right. turns 14 today <laughs> as well. So today's a very special day, and we'll, we'll be uh, celebrating birthdays with both of those uh, special ladies to both of us. Thank you guys both. Uh, to, to the two Chucks, uh, in particular my <laughs> chief, uh, thank you guys for joining us today in, in answering some questions and shedding some light on some of the, the thought and actions uh, behind both the government and our businesses. So, what don't. Cherokee Nation has long been at the forefront of equality as well as health care. Women continue to be sacred in our traditional matriarchal society. Cherokee Nation citizen Dr. Isabel Cobb pioneered the way for all female physicians that continue to follow in her footsteps in service to our tribe. At the close of the 19th century, women held only 5% of medical degrees. Isabel Cobb was one of these pioneering doctors. She was the first physician in Indian Territory and a Cherokee Nation citizen. Born in 1858, Isabel was the oldest of six children. She recalled how witnessing one of her siblings' births influenced her decision to pursue a career in medicine. The post doctor had to be called from Fort Gibson several days after the birth of my mother's baby because no doctor was in attendance. So you see, doctors were needed and that was the main reason for studying medicine. Isabel attended the Cherokee Female Seminary and taught at the seminary for a few years until it burned in 1887. In 1888, at the age of 30, she enrolled at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Following graduation in 1892, 
she completed an internship at the Staten Island Nursery and Child's Hospital and in 1893 returned to Wagner County in the Cherokee Nation to practice medicine. Isabel Cobb was a frontier doctor who visited patients in their homes and did not always collect payment for her services. Specializing in care for women and children, Dr. Bell, as she was called, continued to practice until 1930 and died in 1947. Her legacy lives on today at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. It's the site of the former Cherokee Female Seminary and Isabel's alma mater. The Isabel Cobb Residence Hall opened here in the fall of 2016. Once it became clear that new COVID vaccines were safe and effective, Cherokee Nation put our native speakers at the front of the line to receive those vaccines. This step garnered national attention, and some people outside of our tribe may say that that thought was unusual, but for Cherokees, we've always made the protection of our culture, our history, and ultimately our language our highest priority. One of our elders and a Cherokee speaker and a personal friend of mine, Mr. Charlie Shell, didn't waste any time getting his COVID vaccine here in the Cherokee Nation. Just after getting the vaccine, he said the shot hurt it just a little bit, uh, but it was well worth it to keep himself and others safe. Um, so tell me why it was important for you to come and get a COVID vaccine. Mainly, I don't want to get the virus, but also hopefully it'll show others that are scared to take it that it's okay to take it. Mm -hmm. Well, Doe, Charlie, for your example, and thanks for being a friend and a leader. Um, so between March 17th, 2020 and May 10th, 2021, Cherokee Nation Health Services Call Center and Vaccine Scheduling have totaled nearly 140,000 calls and completed 163,000 daily check-ins with cases and close contacts. That is close to 415 calls per day over the last 14 months. They've also completed case investigations with 15,397 COVID positives and 11,356 of their close contacts. Another speaker, immersion school teacher and friend who is one of the first to receive the vaccine is Ms. Mita Nix. And also joining us is Dr. Beth Harp, who was one of the first, if not the first doctor to receive a vaccine as well and responsible for rolling out the vaccine among our citizens. Would thank you guys both thank for you. being here today and uh, sharing your sharing your time with us. So Mita, the first question I'm gonna ask is gonna be to you. Um, and since you were one of the first people as a Cherokee citizen um, and speaker, can you talk about uh, what it was like to receive the vaccine and, and what difference it's made to you so far? Todd, thank you, and it's an honor to be here today. Uh, I was honored to be able to, to be one of the first to get the vaccine, and also at the time that I knew it would help me and it would help others to know that I was also vaccinated. So it was twofold. I, I was honored to be able to get it, but yet I knew it would help me to keep from getting the virus. So, Miss Mita, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I, what I usually call you is Miss Mita. That's okay. Um, is you know, we've got a common bond between uh, somebody very special to me, mm -hmm. and I know very special to you, in in Brooke Hudson, mm -hmm. uh, who I spent a lot of time with on the bike ride and, and got to know as an individual. Um, and so, you know, could you share a little bit about, um, you know, you, you talked specifically about others, but. Mm -hmm. For you yourself, when you received the vaccine, did you did you have any side effects or any complications when you received the shot? No, I I did not. I I had the sore arm, mm -hmm. which comes from any vaccination, and as far as having any adverse effects, I 
I don't think I really did. I, I know one morning I was in my kitchen doing some things and I got tired, but uh, being at the school, we had just gone through some Christmas activities. So I just kind of thought, well, maybe I'm just tired from this being Christmas and, you know, semester and everything. So I just laid down and took a nap. And after that, I, I felt fine. I, as far as anything other than that, I haven't. I have not have any, had any adverse Great. reactions to it. And I'm thankful for that. I'm pretty sure that sore arm was from all the working out and the weightlifting you It was the working doing. out, okay. not the, not the yeah. shot. Um, so th thank you for that. And, you know, I want to say mm -hmm. personally, uh, from my perspective, you know, not only are you a Cherokee speaker, but you're a veteran. Um, and the fact that you also work in our immersion school and teaching the next generation of speakers uh, is, man, we owe you a debt of gratitude. And so I just want to say thank you for not only your leadership in the community, but inside our school system and uh, take, taking the time to spend with us today to answer some of these questions. I just want to say what don't. So Dr. Dr. Harp, uh, you know, similar to Ms. Mita, you uh, received the vaccine. I think you were the first provider in our healthcare system uh, to receive the vaccine. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, no, um, you know, I got a phone call and said, hey, we've got doses down here. You know, we really need to, we need to get some, some people in and get, get, them, get them going. And I was excited, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pro-vaccine anyway, but, you know, working in our healthcare system, um, I'd, I've lost several patients over the year and it's really hard, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, my colleagues, you know, are, are just frontline workers too, our nurses, everybody's just been working so hard over the past year to, to, to take care of people, to keep people safe, um, and to provide continuous care for our patients already in the clinic and, you know, really just try to keep everyone safe. And so whenever I, I know everyone was so excited to, at the opportunity of a chance to really turn a direction with the pandemic. And so I was excited, you know, I jotted down there, I was ready to go and, um, and really just, it was, you know, like she said, it was really an honor to be able to do that. Um, I grew up in the healthcare system. I'm a local girl. I've worked for the, the tribe a long time. So I felt like it was, um, I felt like it would be helpful for my patients and my family and friends to see that, you know, this is, I trust this vaccine. Um, and and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give it to myself or my, my child's vaccinated. I wouldn't give it to them if I didn't think it was safe. And so on one hand, you know, for my, all of my healthcare workers and my friends, you know, but also for my patients, just so that they know that, yeah, you know, I'm gonna practice what I preach, or practice what I preach. Um, and so I was super excited to have that opportunity so early in the pandemic. Well, Thank you. <laughs> the um, so could you talk a little bit more about, yeah. you know, some of the efforts that, you know, you work obviously in the healthcare system on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of the efforts f from your perspective as a provider inside our clinics and our operations yeah. and some of the efforts that you've made on a daily basis during the pandemic? Sure. So, you know, I mean, on my front, there were so many things. Um, and then there were so many things on a whole different front. Um, as a nation, um, as a Cherokee citizen, I was really proud of, of my tribe during this time. Um, on my, on my, uh, my side of things, you know, we really were able to wo work with the health IT. They were uh, right, a, right off the bat, they were really impressive. Um, they moved really quickly to ensure that we could get um, telemedicine equipment even, you know, because everybody wanted that, you know, and to get your hands on a, a, a webcam was like, you know, was really priceless. And so they moved really quick to make sure that we had those things um, because we knew going into this, I think it was February of 2020, I remember getting an email alert, Dr. Gann and Dr. Mara, who work with our infectious disease and epidemiology programs, you know, said, hey, we've, we've got to have a meeting with our, with our employees because you know this is really about to to, to get here we have to be prepared and and so you know IT started in um, infectious disease and epidemiology public health they moved so quickly to start you know because at that time we thought is this virus going to be is this real is this really going to be as bad is this like the flu you know so many things and um, so early in it to take it so seriously and to be prepared for the worst I think as a health system that was really 
impressive, especially when I think there were a lot of people that thought, oh, this, you guys are crazy. You know, it's, it's not going to be, it's just the flu, you know. So I was really impressed with that, um, with our own health system, our physicians and our advanced practice providers across the network. We're really uh, working hard to learn. How do I, how do I, how do I do what I do, but over the phone or over an audio video connection? So um, that was really um was really an, I was really impressed by all of our, our healthcare team when they were able to make that flip and, and work. Additionally, you know, our nurses, man, those, those nurses are just incredible workers. Um, they worked in our clinics. They worked, they would go to the ER. They trained early on, so they were cross-trained not only in the, the clinic, but the hospital, in the ER. I mean, we really were prepared for, to activate that surge plan that we had at any moment. And so I was really impressed with them. They were really flexible. They, they were happy to, to help. They wanted to learn, they wanted to help. And so that was really, you know, something to be proud of. Yeah, I will say, you know, watching some of the nurses, um, and I'm, I'm gonna share a personal story. Uh, not many outside of a small group know this, but I actually tested positive for COVID in, in January of this year. And although my symptoms were not as drastic as many mm -hmm. others, in fact, lost a coworker that sat about 20 feet from my office and I interacted with on a daily basis. She was one of our first deaths inside the Cherokee Nation and I miss her dearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, I, you know, I also suffered through that, and uh, you mentioned Dr. Mira yes. and the work that he's, right. he stood up a COVID clinic right. uh, to deal with different therapies and treatments to try and protect those, and I was one of his patients, mm -hmm. and, you know, I considered Dr. Mira on a pretty high pedestal before, but seeing his care uh, as a patient, I, I hold him in practically angelic status <laughs> yeah. now, so he's Same. a pretty special guy, it, yes. but watching our nurses and some of our staff that would go outdoors in right. a time when it was uh -huh. 17 degrees yeah. uh, in multiple layers of PPE and protection yeah. and clothes, those nurses did a tremendous job. Oh, yeah. And so I'd like to say thank you to mm -hmm. all of the healthcare staff that helped out right. during the pandemic. You guys right. did an amazing job. Yeah. Todd, I'd like to thank Dr. Harp and uh, to the medical staff. I, uh, I lost a brother to COVID and I'd like to think that um, he would have gotten the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I had a niece that also got COVID and she talked about every day how wonderful the nursing staff was. So my thing to her was, now Carly, you be saying thank you. You thank them, you know, instead of complaining or, you know, say thank you to that nurse because there's no way we can imagine what they were going through or, you know, families lost so many close ones. So I thank the Cherokee Nation that I was able to get this vaccine and I would do it again. I would do it again because I, I, I still yet, I know it's there I, and I don't want to get COVID. I, I do not. And I know this vaccine possibly may not keep me from getting it, but I do know that if I were to get COVID, I wouldn't have the severity of, you know, as versus if I hadn't have gotten the vaccine. So well, I just want to say thank you. Well, I want to take the opportunity to say thank <laughs> you to both of you for being here today and sharing your stories and, and your time, uh, not only Dr. Harp today, but also for, for the last more than year. So thank yes. you guys very much for being here. In a time of great stress and loss, it's often difficult to find joy in laughter. However, as the expression goes, laughter is often the best medicine. Cherokees are famous, and some might say infamous, for our humor. And it's more important than ever that we maintain some levity in our lives. Before we hear from our at-large tribal counselors, let's hear from Cherokee Nation citizen and employee Larry Daughtery, who takes clowning around to a serious level. We're clowns. We're put on this earth to make people laugh. That's a very simple way of putting it, but you are able in just a few minutes to possibly change someone's life.
My name is Larry Darty. I'm originally from Venita, Oklahoma. I uh, live in Owasso and I uh, work for the Cherokee Nation and uh, spend my weekends, days off, and holidays volunteering at uh, the Children's Hospital. I am a clown. <laughs> you are awesome. I was uh, 20 years old when I moved to Los Angeles to try and be an actor. I was able to work on uh, some great movies with uh, uh, Michael J. Fox, uh, with Teen Wolf. I always loved the circus. When I was working with the Pasadena Symphony, uh, one of the cast members had been a clown with Ringling Brothers, and I learned to juggle from him. I was fascinated. From then on, had wanted to be a clown. Came back to Cherokee country, and that's where I got my first job working for the Cherokee Nation for Wilma Mankiller. And uh, that was a, an incredible time. Being around her was like being around a movie star. So I was living in Owasso, and my daughter Katie and I uh, had been swimming. And we stopped to get her something to eat. She became very sick. And so the next morning, we took her to the emergency room at uh, St. Francis in Tulsa. They admitted her and eventually diagnosed her with a life-threatening case of E. coli. We were in ICU for nearly two months. Uh, she was on dialysis. And when they put her on a ventilator, and you're seeing your daughter lying there uh, hooked up to multiple machines and realize uh, you have to be honest with yourself and you can't keep trying to fool yourself that she might not, might not make it. And uh, there's no way to describe it unless you've actually experienced it, been in that hospital room. Uh, you go into a, a, a zone when you're there day and night for months. Every waking moment is concern with your child. During that time, I was doing everything I could do to make her feel better, so I brought all of my tricks up to the hospital. Uh, my jokes, the juggling, balls, anything I could do that would just make her feel better. It was really reaching deep, because she was in bad, bad shape. I started doing uh, entertaining for the doctors and the nurses, and then eventually made my way up the hall to different rooms uh, where there was a child that was well enough to be entertained. In the time that we were there, we saw a lot of families come and go. Some children get to go home with their families and some children go home to see God. Um, Sorry. Katie eventually got better. We got to leave the hospital. Uh, we were uh, blessed. She's a healthy, happy 13-year-old now. Runs track. She's a photographer. She's on uh, student council and couldn't be more proud of the person she was while she was in the hospital and the person she is becoming today. Well, do Larry, for that story, it was very powerful to watch um, and hear you share that story. Um, Similar to his story, the Cherokee Nation values or holds sacred each of our citizens, regardless of where you reside. Those Cherokees living outside the reservation constitute about two-thirds of our enrolled citizens, over 240,000 and growing. 
Maintaining communication with those of you living at large is a huge task. The Cherokee Nation some years ago felt it so important that they created two council positions to support you. Today, we're gonna to hear from those two counselors as they answer questions frequently asked at, at large, by at-large citizens. First, Mary Baker Shaw, who has chosen not to run for a second term for personal reasons, has been a stalwart for education and healthcare. She's worked tirelessly over the last four years to ensure that each of you has a voice on the council. OCO, I'm Tribal Councilwoman Mary Baker Shaw. Wado for attending today's Cherokees Wherever We Are session on the state of the pandemic. For the past three and a half years, I have served as health committee chair for our tribal council. One of the biggest highlights, and perhaps the biggest of all time, has been the pandemic. The COVID-19 hit everyone very hard, including Cherokee Nation. We were fortunate that Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. appointed our chief of staff, Todd Enloe, to oversee our health committee during the pandemic. He appointed immediately Dr. Stephen Jones, who is our CEO of medical services for our tribe, along with Dr. Roger Montgomery, who's the medical executive director. We're very fortunate that we have had other members involved. Dr. David Gann, who is with Public Health, along with Lisa Pivik. And we're blessed to have had a, a Public Health Division assist us at this time. And also we have an, a, a great team in our emergency management services. I'm very, very proud of the job they have done. 53,000 approximately injections of the vaccine have been given to our Cherokee citizens, along with other people now. The vaccine for this pandemic is now available to everyone. Just call our Hastings Hospital Health Service line and see where you can get an appointment and schedule one, not only for you, but for others. And by all means, wear a mask. Continue to wear that mask. The other thing I'm really proud of is the opening of our new outpatient clinic. It is the largest tribally owned outpatient health clinic in America. With more than 469,000 square feet, we have more than 150 exam rooms. So we're very blessed with the size and the opportunity to have such a clinic available. Another highlight is the medical school. Oklahoma State University College of Health Sciences, Cherokee Nation, is now the first tribally affiliated medical school in America. And I'm very proud of that. We're educating future doctors that hopefully will come back and assist uh, Cherokee Nation. There are many opportunities in Cherokee Nation for future growth. Something I would personally like to see would be a drug and rehabilitation facility, along with a long-term care health facility and perhaps even assisted living for our Cherokee citizens. I've really enjoyed serving as at-large tribal counselor for the Cherokee Nation. It's been an honor and I really appreciate the fact that the Cherokees gave me that honor and opportunity. When I leave office, I want to become a full-time grandmother to my three grandchildren. They're all granddaughters and they're looking forward to having the opportunity to spend more time with me. My husband and I intend to locate at a later date close to 60 miles of where they reside. So we're excited about that opportunity. That and along with catching fish and maybe a little golf is what I'm looking forward to. If I could leave one piece of advice to the Cherokee citizens, I would encourage you to make sure you are vaccinated. With approximately the 53,000 that have been vaccinated, we're still not close to herd immunity. We're approximately maybe 30%. Uh, we need between 60 to 70% for us to reach herd immunity. Please, if you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. And please encourage others to do so. And please continue to wear your mask. What up? What up, Councilor Shaw, for your dedication and service to the Cherokee people. Tribal Councilor Julia Coates has been involved with Cherokee Nation government off and on for more than a decade. She knows it's paramount to keep you informed. Residing primarily in California, where there are more than 24,000 Cherokees live, uh, gives Councilor Coates a unique perspective for citizens living outside the reservation. Hi, it's really great to be speaking with all of you today. I wish uh, it was going two ways, but we'll get back to that very soon, some, uh, someday, someday soon. Um, as far as the pandemic and how it's impacted the, the at-large 
uh, work from the perspective of a tribal counselor, there are ways in which it really hasn't been that different for us. We've got 240,000 people that Councillor Shaw and I represent all over the country. And so obviously we can't be in personal contact with so many people. In fact, we have not been in contact with most of you ever. And so uh, for those, for us, uh, it remains a challenge, but it's a challenge that we've always had. Uh, how do we make connection with, uh, with so many people who are, are far flung all over the country, even all over the world? Uh, we've continued to do this in a couple of ways through social media, obviously. I think that for me personally, I've got a, a, a distribution list that I send out information from and I hear back from people uh, oftentimes through it. Uh, so I'm able to communicate with almost 26,000 people uh, through that distribution list. Uh, we try to do the town hall meetings uh, that, that we've done, and we've had a number of them this year with uh, the public health officials from the Cherokee Nation uh, updating us on what the pandemic has been like within the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. So there are things like that. Obviously, the thing that's been most impacted has been the uh, in-person meetings um, but, uh, uh, again, you know, while we hope to get back to that and enjoy that with everyone very soon here, uh, you know, that, that still is just a fraction of the people that we represent. There are some ways in which I think this pandemic has really opened up a lot of opportunities for us, on the other hand, because uh, the, the, um, the digital programming, uh, the Zoom meetings, uh, all of these kinds of things that CCO has, uh, has begun to uh, really escalate. I don't anticipate that those things are going to stop. They should not stop uh, just because we maybe get back to a place where we are able to do the, uh, the in-person meetings, annual meetings once again. This has really uh, driven home, I think, for all of us and made us become much more innovative uh, about the many, many ways that, that we need to keep communicating with each other. It's also been the same kind of opportunity for many of the at-large organizations who have begun to do very much the same thing in their own right. And so they are able to reach out to many more people uh, in their states and surrounding states um, all across the country. Uh, it, it really has sort of shown us the ways in which there are no limits uh, to the ways that we can communicate with each other. And I really hope and anticipate that that's going to keep going on. So, you know, there have been some things about it that um, have, have been challenges, but I really think there's a lot about it that's been a great opportunity as well. Cherokee Nation is here in assisting at-large communities as much as we are allowed by law. 15 of the, uh, 15 of the 25 participating at-large community organizations applied for and received funds to help maintain their organizations as well as aid in food distribution with federal relief dollars overseen by the Cherokee Nation. Additionally, with COVID precautions still in effect, the Cherokee Nation recently drove and distributed food to over a thousand families in the Houston, San Antonio, and Fort Worth areas to relieve shortages during the winter, recent winter blasts, which left millions without electricity. The city of Houston even honored us by proclaiming Cherokee Nation Day in 2021. I am really glad that you chose to join us for today's important event. The second such event in our new Jalagi, where, Wherever We Are series. As at-large tribal citizens, you typically only see the tip of the iceberg regarding Cherokee Nation activities and involvement. Today, we hope you have seen the extent to which our administration has gone to ensure the safety and survival of the Cherokee citizens, not only on the reservation, but also to help both Cherokee citizens and our neighbors abroad. At the very beginning of this pandemic, your Cherokee Nation government took steps based on scientific data in order to be the gold standard for proactively protecting our people and safeguarding our language and culture. When the federal and state government leaders failed to take the pandemic seriously, the Cherokee Nation leaders took matters into their own hands, requiring masks, social distancing, sanitization, and food relief, to name a few. 
They sent employees home to work remotely or for those that couldn't do their jobs remotely, they stayed home with full pay. You learned tonight that the Cherokee Nation provided food for those suffering from stay-at-home orders, bringing food to their areas and often directly to their doorsteps through the nearly 40 community centers built and sponsored by the Cherokee Nation. Those organizational leaders are heroes for continuing to distribute food at personal high risk because that's what our oldest time Cherokee community values teach us, to hold one another existence sacred, to protect and help each other, to lift each other up, especially in times like this. The Cherokee Nation provided financial assistance, including operational funds, capital improvements to those local community organizations to deal with food distribution while re requesting the facilities to remain closed except for those food distribution efforts to keep the citizens safe. We protected our elders and our speakers, ensuring our language and our culture would be preserved and perpetuated. This administration made those difficult decisions because they were the right decisions. You heard about the Cherokee Nation infrastructure additions using federal government funds to make and keep our citizens safe and supplied. No longer will we depend solely on the government to provide masks and sanitation supplies. Now, the Cherokee Nation, with the creation of PPE production facilities in Stillwell and Hobart, can provide local citizens, businesses, governments with all of these supplies. And these facilities are staffed with previously displaced workers, adding good paying jobs with benefits when there were none. This broadcast comes to you today from a facility constructed in part to do what we're doing here today. Like our ancestors, Cherokee thrives in post-European contact by adapting and building on available technologies and processes. From a bilingual Cherokee Phoenix newspaper printed on a printing press to today's modern syllabary on every Windows and Apple product in the world, we continue to embrace technological advances. This very studio is another example of our progression. It provides us a way to educate and communicate the message to the Cherokee Nation that we are strong and we're here to stay. And we will set the standard of excellence in all of the initiatives that we embrace. Please remember, check on your elders, your neighbors, as this year's isolation has been difficult on all of us. We work together to be kind, do good and be well. Wear a mask and do your part by getting vaccinated so we can all return to safe gatherings. And now, the Community and Cultural Outreach Director, Kevin Stretch, and a friend of mine would like to tell you about a new way of staying informed about all things going on inside the Cherokee Nation. Kevin? Hello, Todd. See, on the God, the Cherokee Nation just launched the Gadugi portal which uh, will keep you up to date and engaged, bringing you events, news, and affairs. It provides a simple port of contact between you and your Cherokee Nation. See the link below and sign up today. And our winners of the laptop and swag for our first uh, event is Garth Olson from Seattle, Washington. And the winner of the laptop and swag for this event's pre-registration is Suzanne Muldoon of Strawberry, Arizona. Congratulations to you both and your prizes will be shipped soon. Deputy Principal Chief Brian Warner will now close us in prayer. Deputy. Thank you, Kevin. If you will, bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again, Lord, so thankful for all the many blessings, Lord. So thankful for the fellowship. We ask that you lift those up who are less fortunate than others. We ask that you help us to remember, and we thank you for all the reminders of how we can cover bitterness with kindness, Lord. We ask again that you give us an extra measure of your grace and mercy and help us to remember to love one another as we love ourselves and as we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, Cherokee Nation treasurer Tommy Wildcat will wish us Dona God Dohi until we meet again. What up, deputy?
safe, everyone. This is Doc Sesta Nakata. Do Taco Hai. Don't 